Thank you. So yes, Racket on the PlayStation, PlayStation 3, not quite. <laughs> it's not what you think. But um, so this is a version of a 20 minute talk I've given a few times. I'm gonna see if I can think on my feet and expand it out to the hour, but I'll, I'll ask for, you know, I'll open it up to questions afterwards and we'll have some, a bit of time for that. And I've added a couple videos. We'll see how those go, let's see. So, um, hmm. excuse me one moment, I forgot my notes. <laughs> So, Racket basically allows us to make the games we make. And it allows us to make more game, better games, than we could otherwise make. And I hope I can sort of convey to you how that works. It's hard to present in this sort of format, but let's go. Let's give it a try. Oh, I'm... There's no PA, right? Oh. So. Okay, yeah, I, I speak quietly, so yeah, if you can't hear me, raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> I'll try. I might fade away, but you know. All right, so what just happened there? I think it wanted to suspend. Oh. There we go. There we go. All right, <laughs> The Last of Us. I will, I'm gonna show you guys the trailer for The Last of Us to give a setting for this. And there's gonna be another behind the scenes video towards the end where I can sort of point out individual things that we used our racket-based system to implement. So let's see if this works. And yes, it's the red band trailer, which means uh, it is unrated. Yeah. <laughs> we, this is a, uh, the unrated version of the trailer we um, showed on TV, like a, as, a, as a commercial 30 second spot. All right, let's see if I can get this to go full screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone under 18? <laughs> Who says that I'm not? Yep. What are you scared of? Do I need to remind you what is out there? Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Get you killed. I need something smuggled out to say. Jesus Christ. Just cargo, Joel. How do you know them? I just want some simple gear enough to set me on my way. I reckon it's got something to do with that girl. He's got everything to do with that little girl. It can't be any person in here. Can it? God damn it! We're shitty people, Joel. It's been that way for a long time. Girl, we are survivors. This is our chance. It is over, Tess. What are you so afraid of? You're trying to cause a mighty thin ice here. Perfect. 
Yeah, there's a narrow range of maturity that we're aiming for. <laughs> Just mature enough, but not too mature. So, exactly. Oops. All right. What's that? Uh, basically, it's a survival horror game with creatures that are very reminiscent of zombies. <laughs> So yeah, it's a, it's a zombie genre, basically. So now the dry technical part, which I know you guys all are here for. <laughs> all right, my remote doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Okay, so when we make games, as programmers, we write code, should be familiar to most people here. The artist designers, animators, sound designers, and there's a bunch more people as well, create the data that goes into the game. Um, now, let's see, but because of the way the data is used in the game, we want to create it like we create code. We want to uh, make sure it's structured the right way. We want to check it for errors. We want to make it sure it all connects together in the end. And so there's the uh, discipline of coding can be applied to the way we make data in certain ways. And that's kind of like, that's not like a, a, a fully expressed idea usually at game studios, but coming from our background um, using uh, Lisp-based uh, languages back all the way to the PlayStation 1 in the mid-90s, it did come more naturally to us, and so we decided to uh, utilize that. This is, has a... Uh, a delay there. So kind of some of the things that I'm talking about in terms of data are ways to specify effects like particles or a big thing is animation states which is ways to specify how a character moves like when an animator animates a walk cycle it's just a walk cycle but the character has to run and stop and turn and so those are all other animations that have to be put together in some way that uh, makes sense and that works in the game and is interactive, which is another level of complexity beyond that, that can be stitched together in all the different combinations as the player moves the controller stick. <coughs> um, and then another big one is sort of the gameplay scripting and events that tie together how the game actually plays. And so, yeah, basically every sort of a, if you have a combat encounter, it determines when the zombies, you know, the NPCs are spawned where they're spawned, what they do once they're there, and uh, their orders and how they interact with the player, and it goes on and on and on. And then sound is a huge part as well. The sound effects, the dialogue system, the music. And so we want powerful abstractions. Um, and this, this syntax and language matters and we want it to be suited to the various domains that we have this type of data in. And so the idea of a domain-specific language is a perfect fit. Why is this so slow? There we go. And so they are the, our choice to rescue from us from you know, incoherent data, basically. <coughs> So li like I was saying, Nutty Dog was founded by um, two guys, one of whom was an MIT grad who loved Lisp. And when they started out in, on the PlayStation in 1994, they decided they were gonna write their scripting compiler in Common Lisp. And that was just the beginning. <clears throat> when in the uh, late 90s, when they switched to the PlayStation 2, they decided to write a full native language compiler um, in Common Lisp, and the language they compiled was called Goal. It was essentially C++, but it looked like Lisp. And it took advantage of the macro system of Common Lisp, which they actually, um, they implemented macro system that looked more like a scheme, actually. And so, <coughs> And of course, like the previous talk mentioned, this idea of code and data being the same thing in certain circumstances is very powerful. And we took 
big advantage of that. And when it came time to switch to the PlayStation 3, uh, several forces came into play. One is maintaining our own compiler to c for the actual like product, like um, a native code compiler, and the debugger, and the, uh, the entire tool chain was prohibitive for a game studio where our entire focus is just making games. And so, and also, we were more integrated with our parent company, Sony, and all these forces came to bear and made us de decide to switch over to C++. So we chucked the entire system out. But, you know, that was too much. We still needed the stuff I've been talking about. And so we decided to look around for um, a, a new solution that could take care of just the parts that we desperately needed, essentially. And it was, I guess, 2004, 2005. I looked around, and after evaluating a bunch of different implementations, I settled on a language called MZ Scheme, PLT Scheme at the time. And we started building something called DC, which is sort of an unoriginal, uninspired name for data compiler. Um, well, it's for character in the game. Uh, is it? I don't <laughs> 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 no, I mean, it, you just, and um, you know, an, uh, all, all, a lot of people joke that it's also Dan's compiler, because I'm the <laughs> one who wrote it. And then, yeah, so we selected MZ Scheme at the time, because it was a good Lisp, and open source was, was a big factor, because um, similar to the previous talk, this was not exactly a, uh, an authorized project in the company. <laughs> it wasn't a sort of management decision to go out and um, you know, purchase a Lisp and build a project around it. This was more like, we have a set of problems that we need to solve. The most pressing one was the animation problem of how to stitch together all these different animation states. And we had just thrown out our great solution for that. So we needed a, a new one. And so I looked around and selected MZ scheme based on these qualities. And this Oh, really? <laughs> and at the time, I was totally disconnected from the community. And so I, you know, for example, I didn't know how to even say the word. <laughs> Mrs. Scheme? Nice. Yeah, nice. So yeah. And then, yeah, we selected Mrs. Scheme and haven't looked back. Um, so our system is a, uh, I guess, yeah, I'll take questions. I joined in 2002. So that was the tail end of the PlayStation 2 era. The, basically our... Still have that, uh, the yes. Era? Yes. Yeah, the, the language and technology is tied to our platform. PlayStation 2 era was the goal common Lisp era. And I worked on Jack 2, Jack 3, and Jack X, which are all goal-based games. Um, and so when we switched to PlayStation 3, of course, I had all this experience working with Goal, and we had now switched to C++. We'd hired a bunch of new people who were all very familiar with C++, but not Goal, and so there was this disconnect. And so there's actually kind of an opportunity to sort of create enough of what we had before in this new environment where our systems are C++-based and integrate the two. And so that's what we did. Um, our system is essentially a racket program that evaluates a sort of typed um, subset, well, it's a typed language organized around building data in the correct format. And it's uh, has, the language is still built on top of Racket, so we still have access to the Racket uh, system. So, yeah, it looks like Racket, but it's got this extra syntax that is similar to what we had before, goal to build um, data types and data instances and use the macro system to like build these large assemblies of, of data. And the product, the, the sort of build product, are these binary files essentially that the runtime C++ system can load up and use directly. And so the use of the syntax was the big win for building the various domain-specific languages that we needed. 
but it also caused us a lot of headaches because it, it was very difficult for us to wrap our minds around how the syntax system works, like the hygienic macros. And, and also, um, it, it felt inefficient in terms of going through multiple transformations at runtime, generating garbage, um, and yeah, the basically just learning how to use the system was a bit, there was a learning curve. It's very different from no, what, yeah, yeah. It's very different than what uh, we were used to. And by we, I'm talking about just a few of us that had been used to the goal common list-based macro system and the majority who were just C++ programmers who had, you know, had experience with C++, maybe Python or Lua or things like that and not Scheme at all. And then for a long time, a part of our confusion led to us having a lot of difficulty getting good error uh, tracking in our uh, compiler, basically. Um, because the syntax transformations, as we implemented them quickly throughout all the source location, we would get errors that were inside the compiler or errors that were inside our macros, but never, or very seldom, pointing back to the original source. And because our system is used by our designers, our technical designers and technical artists, um, to a large degree, that was a major headache because for them, seeing the error that's in the compiler is not very useful. It's more like, you know, there's an error somewhere in this file that you've just edited. So, you have to go and figure out what you changed and use a source control to figure out what is different and track down the error. So that happened a lot. That still plagues us to a certain amount to this day because we have a lot of legacy syntax that we have around. And so we go back and rewrite it to, to track errors better. Legacy from gold. No, legacy from starting, you know, seven years ago. Oh, oh, Our oh, system. Oh, okay. So are you hash line based? Uh, no, we are not. We know they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are a legacy application, and our legacy is one of coming from coming to NIS scheme sort of cold, and not really <coughs> have a good understanding of a lot of the good stuff that you guys have been working on in the interim. <laughs> and so that's you know why big reason why I'm here to talk to you guys about how to understand that better and use it. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of the architecture of the system. Um, my laser pointer work? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we have a source DC file, and the sort of these arrows right here are the magic. That's the racket compiler. Go ahead. Yes. Um, yes, the DC file is just a raw text file. Um, it's our source code. It's generated at this point a number of different ways. Mostly it's written by programmers and designers, usually in Notepad++ or Visual Studio, <laughs> even though it's S expressions, it's essentially Lisp. Um, we also generate it um, from the game. We generate it from uh, Maya plugins, and we generate it from a few other different places as sort of an intermediate format for other pipeline, like data pipelines. So maybe we can ask a question differently. What is a designer or an animator a, a person see? And, and would, I mean, the, the person is at the left of the screen, probably. Right. Um, and, and so they, they sit in front of a screen that it says no time. Yep. And they type DC files. Yes, they no do. No syntax support. No syntax support. Well, I take that back. We have a plugin for Visual Studio that that uh, highlights our DC language and has some syntax support. Okay. But there is, yeah, very little. There's, we don't use Dr. Racket, for example. That's something I would love to, to remedy. Um, <clears throat> and some of us. And how big a file does an animator deal with? 10 lines, 1,000 lines? Um, it ranges, yeah. Could be a big file. Yeah, there could be several hundred files in many cases. And it's. I don't have good examples, unfortunately, but the files don't look like programs. They look like data. They're big tables, essentially, big arrays of sort of like maybe animation states or animation transitions 
the say like this like idle animation, which is sort of a standing still, to a walk animation has there's a transition between the two, and this is how long the blend takes, and you know various other attributes it of it. It is a program. It is. Yeah. yeah. But I just think that you're typing in data. Yes. Go ahead. When you're doing like these animation blends in that DC file, is it referencing a bunch of Maya 3D file things that are external? Yeah, basically, yes. Okay, so that stuff's not like stuck in there. No, we don't have like the animation data of like where the joints are and all that stuff. Okay. That's not in DC, no. Okay. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, these two arrows, this, this is our compiler. <coughs> this is our DC compiler. So it has two outputs. One is our data file, which is taken by the actual runtime on the PlayStation 3 or 4 um, and used directly. And then there's the header file that's an output that is put into our C++ build system, included by our C++ files. Um, and essentially, it tells the C++ what the format of the data is. And at runtime, it can use it directly. There's no intermediate, there's no marshalling, there's no nothing. Um, it can just load up the file and use it. So I'll give an example of how that works. Um, <clears throat> so this is, we're gonna build up to this. Um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna take a, the, a several steps to build this piece of data, which is essentially a simplified version of telling the game where to put the player at a certain point, basically. A position and a rotation. Put them at the origin and rotate around the y-axis by 45 degrees. It's just an example of one of the things we do. So <clears throat> we will define a type. And so this def type name is left over from goal. So there's some compatibility. Actually, this whole format is left over from goal, which is kind of interesting. Um, starting today, I would probably do it differently. but. Uh, back when we started, we wanted to make a simple transition for the people who were familiar. So what this says is a VEC4 is a type that should be allocated a line to a 16-byte boundary. It consists of four floating point values, um, and it's a struct, basically, in C++. Um, and the default value for the W will be zero. Um, yes, we, this is a, a nice, because uh, in Racket you can treat numbers as numbers, we just do that, and at this point it's just a number. And somewhere along the export we say, oh, we're going to write a float, so it, the conversion happens. What if you don't need default x1, t, what is in there? Well, that's a good question. It's it sort of, I'm, I'm playing a trick here, because the, the, basic float type has a default of zero anyway. That's just sort of a convenience there. So this could be anything else. It is default, it's not a raw thing. What else is there? Um, there is a default, yes. It's not just, yeah. yeah. And so here's our def type, our original type, and here's what it looks like when it gets exported to the header file. It's fairly straightforward. Um, actually, uh, it's missing. We, 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 yeah, we take the align, we use um, GCC intrinsics to, to mark that as an align type. But actually it doesn't really matter because we don't use this structure to allocate things at runtime. We use this structure just to read what has been allocated by our compiler. So it really doesn't matter that it's, it doesn't need the, the specifier for the 16 byte alignment because when we export our data to our binary file, it'll be 16 byte aligned and it'll just work. <clears throat> and so now we have um, type inheritance. So we want to take our raw VEC4 and create a stronger type to do our 3D math. So we inherit a uh, quaternion off of it, and we inherit a point off of it, and then we override the default for the W to be 1 to make our affine geometry nice. <clears throat> and then we put them together into something called a locator, which is sort of a, a Maya concept. It's just basically a, a point in rotation. And now we have these funny, uh, we call them like fields, attributes, 
again, leftover from goal, I would probably do it differently at this point and call, yeah. But anyway, this basically says those fields are inline, which means the resulting struct, as, you'll, as we'll see, um, they're not pointers. Right. So yeah, it, it basically, we're, we're implementing the C++ data binary interface in Rackin. So this is what the header file will contain. And our C++ code knows how to deal with this, and so it does. And here's a bunch of, this is an example of how we can use all of Racket when we do this. When we decide to uh, create a location to put the player, we can write arbitrary Racket code to you know, convert an axis and, a, and an angle to a quaternion. Um, I mean, the content of this is not so important. It's just the idea that we can use all of Racket at any point in our system, which has been a big win. We can write arbitrary code to produce our data. And then, so we're getting there. Um, we create a, a, a y-axis and an origin, and then we put it together to create um, an instance of that locator, which is putting the player at the origin, rotated by, around the y-axis by 45 degrees. And then that gets compiled into our data file, our bin file. And at runtime, we just look it up and use it in our C++. So any questions here? Yes, that's correct. So yeah, we take this idea, we kind of run with it. Um, this data can be um, dynamically loaded at any time. So we use that. So say like in Uncharted 1, we had nine megabytes of this, this data that we've generated that we had kept around the entire game. In Uncharted 2, we decided to load it dynamically and relocate it, basically garbage collect it. And we reduced the size of our our, our buffer to five megabytes. And it's been the same ever since. So we have, and we've, we've generated much more data over time. So this dynamic allocation is a, is a, is a big win. So, you know, like for, for example, static data in C++ gets built into the image. The ex executable image is carried around all the time, but this allows us to swap it in and out, which on an you know, embedded platform is a huge win. So it looks like you have a one global namespace Yes. Yes. When we first started, yeah, we had a global namespace. This is a simplification of our current system where um, we can split the namespaces into multiple modules. It's, it's pretty simple, but it's enough so that, say, we load sound effects. We have, you know, 25,000 sound effects, and each one is an, ins an individual instance of this data. We don't put that in the global namespace. We put it in a special audio module, and we look it up directly there. Mm -hmm. um, does your system take care of, this data has already been loaded, and there's a new version that's different than what has moved around in the memory of C++? Do you see what the problem that I'm imagining is? Yeah, so... So for instance, you copied pause now. Or, well, actually, this one has a copy pause at that point. Actually, no, that is a, that is a copy because you said that pause is just there, right? Whatever. You see what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> I, I can answer a slightly different question. Hopefully, we'll get at you. We have uh, a way of uh, another big win of the dynamic. Well, we've always had this sort of this dynamic loading. We just didn't use it at runtime as the, uh, the game shipped. We use that now. But 
Originally, we used it so that, um, say, designers running the game can take our player start and change a number, change that 45 to 90 or something, and then type something at the racket listener that recompiles it and sends it to the game without restarting the game. And so it, it basically replaces it in memory, and the next time the code goes through a loop and looks it up, they find the new value. No, it is not. <laughs> so another simplification, as part of our C++ code, we hash strings in the compiler. So it knows to go to this location in memory. There's a hash table that takes a 32-bit value and looks it up. So yeah. Yeah, we don't, do, we don't deal with strings as if we ever can avoid it. Yeah, yeah. I had a question on this. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you escape to record in the merit calculation in your DC. Yes. Thing. I guess I'm not really sure. You're talking about well, precision of the, the number? You know. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of an advantage. We do all our calculations at the... But well, you have to ship it over to... At some point, you write it out. Yes. The, and the writer presumably converts it to something that's like C++ except as a float. Yeah, basically it gets converted to a single precision float and in the export. You lose the float yes. And you don't worry about that. You don't care. We do worry about that, but we use single precision floating point throughout our entire runtime, and it's so a constant, like low-level headache, yeah. always. So that's the question is, have you ever tried to have a high precision numerics in the C++? Uh, no. Because it's slow, or? Yeah, basically, too much. There's too slow. T it takes up too much space. Oh, All our vector intrinsics are based on single precision vectors of single precision uh, and, floating and point numbers. Show up in the graphics, in the audio, and the animation. No, it does show up. It does show, yeah. I thought, I thought I saw slips, and uh, is that based on stuff like that? In this little movie, except that they showed up. Oh. Glitching. No, no, no. Those we have we have a million sources of glitches, but oh. so. Um, not in these cases. What, what is, basically our rule of thumb is things like um, in Uncharted 2 there was a section where you're on a train and train travels fast. And so the level the train exists in is very large. And if the further you get from the origin, the, the more the floating point inaccuracy shows up. And our rule of thumb is you're about, and for our units, um, we're in meters. So. The rule of thumb is if you're about four kilometers from the origin, things are going to go wonky. <laughs> Don't go that far on the train. Yeah, your physics starts to, to break down and everything else starts to go as well. And so single precision problems. Um, yeah. And that's sort of our solution is we rebate, we like reparent our space back to the origin or we have local space. We create a whole local space system to deal with the train in Uncharted 2 where all our physics will happen on a train car, like in a local space on the train car. And the train car is bouncing around in physics, moving through the level to deal with this. So it's a, uh, that's, that, that solved that problem without going to doubles, so. <laughs> you have, it's a lot of programming effort. Yeah, there, yeah. yeah we had to re redo how we, all of our, basically all of our locators, like this locator, our locator has like a, a parent you know, pointer to a parent space now. So it knows where it's about to the space. Yes, yeah. But that allows us to do a, uh, a cruise ship on Uncharted 3 that tossed and turned in the ocean and you could go, like, explore the entire ship as it moved through the, the world and stuff like that. But well, yes, at, th at this time, yes, we just deal with we made our system compatible with GCC, which actually was a bit of a headache because GCC likes to play some tricks with its padding and stuff like that. But yeah, that's our, our target. Okay, so, how am I doing for time? Okay, this might work. Wrong screen. Come on. How do I get this to happen? Yeah, that's better. All right. 
This is a sort of behind the scenes video and if I'm on my toes, I'll pause it at various points and talk about how we did various things that they're talking about in the video. And again, it's, it's kind of violent, so just a warning. <laughs> The combat in the game feels very intense. Ah, very personal. It's like closer cameras, more intimate. You want to feel each concussive strike. People you're fighting in this world are, are no different from you. They're survivors just like you. They're trying to find anything to get by. We want to make you feel for these enemies. We want to make you hate them, feel sorry for them, be afraid of them. Make you feel kind of bad when you shoot them. You have to feel that there is that consequence to engaging with these people and that there is something at stake. Your objective's on lining up, so now it's time to kill a beacon. That's when you know the characters interact with their environment while they're fighting each other. So you slam a guy against the wall, a guy slams you against the wall. <laughs> Grounding of the of the combat in the game world, which kind of makes it a lot more interesting and more real. Nothing really says you're in this environment like having your head slammed against it. <laughs> Stealth component is a big part of using the environment, like finding intelligent places to hide that give you flank groups. And the AI analyzes the space that they're in, and they, they know, like, here's a place to hide that will allow me to flank the plant around the side. So he's talking about the AI knowing how to, to flank the player. Um, so this is a, a place where our system came in to uh, help us quite a bit. So. Uh, offline, our tools will analyze the space and find like cover locations, for example, this, this little wall here and corners around it and say, you know, you can take cover here or here or here for the AI and you'll be protected from, you know, being shot by the player. At runtime, we have a whole set of, um, we call them post analyzers because these are posts that the, uh, that the uh, AI can use. And these analyzers are things that are evaluated at runtime so the AI can decide where to go. And each analyzer has um, various criteria. It has like a runtime script function that it can call to, to analyze arbitrary stuff, basically. And we go through the, the AI single NPC will go through all the various um, criteria, essentially, to decide what to do. And that criteria is set up by our programmers and designers using our system and it's a form of data, basically, but it contains code as well because we have a bytecode compiler that we've built out of our system in addition. And so we can look at the data, we can evaluate the functions, and figure out what to do. So that's one application that we've used. The space you're playing in is an extra character, and it's going to change the dynamic of every combat play. And then when an encounter happens, we want things to slow down. I'm going to use this thing that we call listen mode. Let's Joe kind of focus his attention, his hearing. I'll check out the hearing. Go we'll check over there. So if a guy's knocking the can over or he's speaking, I want to kind of see a visual representation of that sound in front of me. It lets me kind of know where guys are in the world. But that lets us build tension. And that lets me now look at Ellie and see where Ellie's at and kind of approach the situation carefully. are helping you and you are helping them and there's a back and forth. And Ellie will start doing things like picking up a break from tossing it to enemies to distract them and to help you out in combat. What we wanted them to do is to have their vocals be an assist to you in your life. Ellie will call out when an enemy is near you and is just starting to gain line of sight on you. She'll say, on your right and try to give you some hints as to where the enemy is. So that's another example. The, the dialogue is a big part of this because 
when you're uh, sneaking around NPCs and you have, they talk about Ellie who's, who's with you and on your team the entire time, the sort of the speech, the way that the things they say to each other and when they do it is a huge part of the gameplay. And so there's another system similar to our AI post analyzer that's um, a huge set of dialogue lines and accompanying data and functions that the game could use at runtime to figure out when the AI should say something. Um, things like there's events that happen, like an AI sees the player, that's an event, then they go through the dialogue system and figure out what they need to say, like, oh, there he is, or I found him, or things like that, that are based on whether he's seen the player before, what another AI has said to him, um, where he is, what state he's in, he's already like looking for the player or he's totally surprised by the player. So the, all these criteria come into play and there's, and there's a bunch more as well. And so we need a, a, like a robust system to take all these criteria into account and come up with a, the right answer right away at runtime, which is no easy feat, but this is part of what the system buys us. Do you really want oh, sorry. Do you really want a list at runtime? Well, yes but we don't want to pay the price of memory allocation or garbage collection. Um, and we really appreciate this, the strong typing and stuff like that. So yeah, there's, there's, there's further work that we're um, looking at doing in that area. But we basically, uh, we use this system, like the way we built that locator, we use a similar system to compile bytecode from a, a typed, a little typed scripting language and we use that all over the game to script the gameplay, to tell the AIs what to do, to, um, to analyze these things, like the dialogue and the, the post analyzer stuff. So I'm gonna jam this jaw, and I'm pinned to the ground, that clicker, test might come in and like shoot an infected right off of me, and it's like, cool, I'm relying on them, and they're relying on me, and I feel like I'm working the space together with them. You might say, they did a bad thing. They killed somebody. They didn't do something that seems fully morally just. Well, you're going to think that they're bad people unless you, as the player, feel how terribly difficult it is to survive. The pressure is so terrible in this world that you just have to make a choice and live with it. All right now, I'm gonna jump down there and I'm gonna clear us a path. What about me? You reckon you can handle that? Just so we're clear about back there, it was either him or me. So, any questions? I want to know, in comparison, so what do, what do other game studios do? How do they manage this complexity? Um, I'm not a good authority on that, but what I, do, what I have figured out is they use a lot of different systems. For example, um, the scripting system in other games, like Unreal Script, for example, deals with just the idea of scripting NPCs and events as the game progresses. Like, it's fairly narrow. Um, and they'll use a different system, a totally different system, to put together the animation. And a totally different system to put together the effects. And a totally different system to put together the audio. And um, there's certain advantage to that, advantages to that, because the different systems are much more, like, very much designed for the purposes, the individual purposes. And they also, um, and this is something that's generated friction within Naughty Dog, they'll generate nice user interfaces, like GUI interfaces that are uh, built for each particular system. The big cost is they have large teams of programmers to build and support these. Our, our tools programming team is like two people. Two, two yeah. And so we are able to use this system 
and not have a large tools team that builds all these different, uh, you know, like basically applications. Um, and of course, I can say we have two tools programmers, but we also rely on a lot of um, work done by Sony at large because we're a Sony studio. So, um, and they use C Sharp, and so we do too for various things, and for like interface stuff. Like our level layout tool is not in DC; it's in a, a C Sharp based application. So we do it as well. But this this is this system has the advantage of just sort of being able to be good enough at everything that people just use it, and that's how it's grown and, and uh, been adopted by the company. Do you get any synergies by being able to have everything in the same system? Hmm. Yes. Yes, because our, our basically our scripting API is available to the uh, gameplay scripting system, sort of the, like I'm saying, the post-analyzing system, the dialogue system, and other systems as well. They all have the same interface. They can all ask the same exact questions, like, Where's the player? They all can use the same interface for that. Uh, so speaking of GUI stuff, uh, earlier somebody asked you, you had a graph showing how everything's compiled. So what's left of the DC file? You said, well, it's basically code. It's written by hand. But you did mention something about tools like Maya. I guess it's like a 3D mm -hmm. tool. So I'm curious, do you have like you know GUI tools, like maybe somebody designs, uh, designs like a motion with like a 3D tool, and then you not really we we don't generate large amounts of data for DC to use um, the only thing that that is like that is our Maya system that generates our effects definitions it, it, it started out as hand-coded stuff to generate how particles work and the textures they use and the timing and all that stuff um, and as our effects teams grew, they needed a, a GUI system because that's how they work. And so we put a GUI system on top of that that spit out DC data. But that's, there's really only a couple examples like that. It's, it's not ideal as an intermediate format. Um, it is workable, but it's kind of verbose and performance is not as high as running a custom tool that generates the stuff directly. Wake up. Okay, so there's a couple more slides. So this is just some of our numbers. Um, we have about 16 programmers in the game project, 20 designers, lots of artists and animators. And then um, we have about 6,000 DC files covering a bunch of different uh, purposes. And then that's how much source. And we compile it out down to about 45 megabytes of, of you know, uh, object data. And then we squeeze that all into five megabytes at runtime, so that's our big data, <laughs> um, by swapping things out as we go. So. Can't you just rely on the operating system to do the swapping, et cetera, or is it a I was, it's like no. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very constrained environment. The OS, I mean, we do use the OS to load the files in. Uh, we don't use MMAP because uh, we don't have virtual memory. Um, yeah, we load the files in. We, we, have a, we have a heap that we manage, and we load the data directly in, and we shift it around using memmove, you know? It's, uh, it's like very low-level, manually managed stuff. And that's, that's the PlayStation 3 environment. And the PlayStation 2 environment as well. Can you uh, speak a little bit more about the uh, micro generation system and how you avoid that kind of allocations? What was the last part? How you avoid uh, dynamic memory allocations and garbage collection cycles? Right. OK. So yeah, the question is how we avoid garbage collection in our bytecode uh, like runtime system, right? Yeah. Yeah, so our, our language that we compiled the bytecode is very constrained. Um, it does do allocations, but this is a whole different subject of memory management in our code on the console. Um, every type of memory is different. And so what we let the, our scripts allocate is basically what's called single frame memory, memory that is, you know, um, 
blanked and reused the next frame. And so our scripts have to be very, well, we have to be very careful, it's very constrained. You can allocate something, you have to use it right away. You can't wait around and it, it won't come back. Um, you can get pointers to data that, that does live for longer, but you can't allocate stuff that, does, that lives for longer. That may change, but um, I, I just know that on the PlayStation 2 we have, and PlayStation 3 as well, we have only certain types of memory was garbage collected and it was a big focus issue, or, uh, a performance issue, a focus of, of effort to make sure that we only did so much at certain times and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah. Of the 120 megabytes of DC source, have you have any idea how much of that is going to the racket? Because you said racket all of Very that little. Is in DC. Yes. And, and is every file is, uh, is getting the racket or just like a few of them? Well, so every file is um, basically racket code that gets passed through syntax transformers, but yeah. yeah very, very few, very little of this actually calls any sort of, you know, racket lambda directly for any reason. Right. So there's no call out the map or four or four flow. Like, it's rare. Yeah, it's pretty rare. So they yeah. call it standard library functions that you wrote the thing? Most of it is not calling, it's not really calling anything at all. It's, well, it's like syntax um, that gets, like a large chunk of it is something we call render settings, which is a huge, chunk of data that defines like how the rendering and the lighting and uh, various aspects of a particular scene look and we have m maybe a thousand of those and they're all just a bunch of floats so that's like a large part of this um, but yeah like uh, the gameplay scripting is another big part and that does call a bunch of the standard stuff that, that is ours and it gets passed to the syntax transformer it doesn't do any racket stuff or very, does very little. So the underlying scripting is it sort of like a, a funded state machine for, for the transitions and stuff like that? Are you talking about the animation stuff? Yeah. Or? Yes, it is, a, it is a big state machine for each character. There's like their, their, their animation states, like idle and running and crouching and jumping and all that stuff. It's a, it's a big state machine. We do, yeah, we do a lot of syntax transformation on that stuff. It's a fairly, it's one of the, the richer languages that we've built, actually, because it's very complex, and it's, it was the original purpose of this, so. We have one more slide. So yeah, that, I'm about done, okay, good. Um, Yes, the expressiveness and power of Racket has been a big win, but the library support as well, it makes it so very easy for us to integrate Racket into our pipelines. We run Racket on Windows and on Linux. We've used the 32-bit version. We've used the 64-bit version. It's linked into our tools. It's standalone. It's, we use it in all different ways. And so, yeah, the source location and performance of the syntax transformation, I'm not sure how relevant the performance is today. Yeah, um, I think it's an issue. I think my understanding of it has been a bigger issue. So, but the source location, yeah, that, that has been an uphill battle to, uh, to correct. And sort of S expression based languages are a tough sell. That's, that's a recurring theme, yes. And it's designers, non-technical people, it's very foreign, very strange. But as time has gone on, the sort of friction and complaining, so, so to speak, <laughs> coming from people using it has dropped off to nothing. It's, it doesn't, it's not an issue at this point because it's so clear that it's such a win in terms of implementing what people need and want to implement that they uh, understand this, this sort of limitation is, is part of the, the it's part of the, uh, the power of it. Yeah, and so. Uh, if you don't direct a special life itself to the various DC scenarios and give an almost parenthetically free language, it's much easier to use to convince animators and artists to deal with that. It's possible. 
even even our designers who are only kind of programmers, they have their editor preferences. They they standardize on Notepad plus plus. I, you know, <laughs> I've I've pushed Emacs, but that may not have been the best idea. A few of them, a few of them did use it and to standardize you know macro package and blah blah blah. Uh, but still, yeah, something like Docker Racket would have a better chance. I would say that much. And despite the foreignness of it, we've had a lot of people come in with zero scheme Lisp experience and very little programming experience even, and extend our implementation and do neat things. Like one of the, the most interesting things recently was one of our designers who is more technical and is able to do scripting, uh, quite a bit of scripting, um, between games had taken our scripting language and essentially implemented um, a car with all the physics and the driving and stuff. And it's like, I was very surprised by that. It just te it's a testament to the richness of our underlying API, API the, the, the power of our, our language, and um, sort of his ingenuity at piecing it all together without any programmer help. And we didn't have vehicles before this point. Like we had a jet ski and that's it. He put together a car with wheels that move and like everything. I think so, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, am, I have no doubt. So. Did you guys have to tweak this code at all to get to run efficiently? Well, I guess the short answer is it hasn't shipped yet. So <laughs> I don't know. I think it would require a bit of effort. There, there is a, a model of designers prototyping complex things in script and then programmers needing to like sort of down code it yeah. in C++. Uh, we haven't had to do all that much of that, actually. So, and something I didn't mention, it's I've, we've used a very functional style throughout, and that's been a big win. Um, and particularly because it matches the model of what we're doing, which is taking data and just transforming it multiple times to get it to the exact right format. So. The pipeline is very functional and functional in nature, and so the the functional style of Racket has been a good match. I think that's it. Yep. Any more questions? Okay. Uh. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Yeah. Um. I was wondering, are you able to use Racket to do any kind of We don't really do that. We could do that. We don't have a. We don't really have a culture of doing that in any place, anywhere at all. <laughs> it's just you know, it just all go you know to develop the game and get it out there. And if it does, something doesn't work, we fix it, and we find it out in testing and QA and playing it. So, yeah. Good. Oh, for the Xbox? Yeah. No, I have not. Um, oh, sorry. Have you adapted your systems for the PS4 Vita? So, uh, um, not the Vita. I'm not sure what I can say about the PS4. I, <laughs> it's been a big secret, but our, our president just tweeted a picture of uh, like 100 PS4 dev kits that are sitting in our hallway. <laughs> I think that's as far as I can, as much as I can say about the PS4. <laughs> so. Let's take additional questions uh, during the break. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Oh. Thank you.